took us to Washington, you know, the necessary trip, everybody goes to the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, and all those things. And this was 1948. Jackson was driving a, a gray Plymouth convertible. And my dad pulled up next to him at a, a red light in Washington, tooted the horn, and said that Justice Jackson Neckers from Clymer. And they sort of scowled at each other and went in the other direction. Uh, anyway, so that's my experience with Bob Jackson, but it's more than anybody else's here, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Clymer case that Bob Jackson was involved in, and that's what he was called. I didn't know him as Justice Jackson, he was Bob Jackson, and he didn't always have just Bob in front of him. Anyway, this is a picture of Justice Jackson with his son Bill at Yale graduation in 1941. Uh, Bill was fortunate in the context that uh, uh, Justice Jackson himself did not have a college education, but Bill did. He had a college education from a very good, very good university. And this is his graduation picture. Well, let's talk about the Clymer case for just a minute. Jackson was in Sam Irwin's you know, vernacular, just a country lawyer. And uh, he didn't go to law school. He didn't go to college. He got a law degree by, by writing for the law. Um, that was done in those days, and it was, it was not so unusual. Neither was it unusual in when I started teaching in 1964 for students to finish three years of undergraduate work and then get admitted to medical school and go to medical school. So we've changed at this level now. They, they line up to try and get their admissions taken care of both law and medical school. But in, in, uh, in, in the 60s, this was, that was not the case. So anyway, Jackson was a small town country lawyer, Jamestown, and then my small town was a lot smaller than that. That's the town of Clymer. But you know, when you have entrepreneurs in the town, they're going to fight with one another, and that's what happened in Clymer. This is a picture of Broken Straw Creek, uh, which is about one mile out of the little town of Clymer, which is 20 miles from here. We've gone to Peak and Peak for lunch or something like that. That's what we're talking about. Uh, small town, mostly Dutch immigrants, mostly sons of Dutch immigrants by the time this took place, and very entrepreneurial. Edison uh, was very much associated with, with Chautauqua Institution, as we all know, and the light bulb really didn't show up much before the 20th century. The work that I'm talking about here began right after the beginning of the 20th century, and this little town built an electric, uh, an electric power plant. What they did was dam up the creek. What here at Tempest did was dam up the creek. And this is called Broken Straw Creek. I have a. So, this, this is called Broken Straw Creek. And they dammed this creek. And over on this side, put, built a power plant and let the, the, the run from the, uh, the water behind the dam turned the generator, which created electric lights in the little town of Clamour, uh, up until the advent of what now we know, what I used to know as Niagara Mohawk. I'm not even sure what it's called anymore, but we knew it as the Niagara Company. And the Niagara Company bought these little electric companies in 1930, 1931, at which point this all became obsolete. And though you see the remnants of the dam, uh, this, this, this dam was destroyed by a, a big storm that I happen to remember. I was a little boy, but I remember it. Uh, that took out the dam and it's never been built. Now, what was the fight about? Well, it turned out that over on this side, behind the dam, there was uh, a power, was a, 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 a lumber mill, a sawmill. And the, the man that owned the sawmill wanted to use this, this water to float his logs back to the sawmill where they would be then processed and done whatever. And so he sued first to keep this guy, Tempest, who wanted the water flowing most of the year so he could have electric power most of the year. So he built the, the water up and down. Dam. He, he didn't like the water going up in the pond, up and down. So he sued over riparian rights. And then the, then the lawsuit was 1925. And the courts found that the riparian rights, if it was not natural water, you didn't have the rest of it. So the guy that owned the sawmill basically was too bad. There was a flood going on, and it, didn't, uh, it wasn't anything that he could do anything about. So that was settled on, 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 in 1925 on behalf of Tempest, who owned the park. And then down in here, there was 
land. And so Catfish was the other guy's name. He said, well, I'll fix him. I'll buy some of that land. And it turned out this guy was going bankrupt, and then he died. And, and, and what happened was there was a land contract with never any deed. And so the, the, the bank, which my grandfather ran, had the mortgage on the property and was asked by Catfish to give him a deed for part of the property, which, he, which they didn't do. They said they wanted to sell it to recover the total mortgage. And that's what they eventually did. And the lawsuit was over whether or not they had the right, do I have this right, John? <laughs> whether they had the right to sell the property for, uh, for uh, uh, to, to recover what was the mortgage of the, the man who had this, this, uh, this land. That happened to be the <coughs> first case that, that Jackson won the New York Court of Appeals. So what I heard as a boy <laughs> about Bob Jackson was that he was a lawyer, a very good lawyer, but then something happened. And what was that? Well, this is the power. <coughs> this is the power company as it existed in 1925. I showed you a picture of the final power company, and Greg mentioned that my grandfather was the president of the final bank. Uh, struck the times in the world, a bunch of Dutch immigrants who were making their way out of really poor land in western New York, scrambling along making a living, finding their way uh, to, uh, to succeed in life. Uh, and what happened, well, 1933, the election of 1929, first 1933, the election of 1933, and Roosevelt's first act, President Roosevelt's first act, was he closed the banks. And any bank that was not a federal bank was closed. So the bank, the bank furloughed from March 19 to 1933. My grandfather was president of the bank, he lost quite a bit of money, and I can personally remember when he said to my uncle, who was a professor of chemistry also, sometime in 1950, 1951, they didn't have PMO insurance in those days, no direct office insurance, no Chubb insurance company. Uh, when he said to my uncle, well, I finally paid them all off. What did he, what, what did he pay off? Well, all the depositors that had money in that bank, uh, which was solid, was substantially solid in 1933. He paid him off personally. So by 1952 or something like that, he was no different than a lot of little business stuff, a lot of little town businessmen. Uh, the man who sued on the question of the power company, Broken Straw Creek, uh, was named Earl Catfish. Earl Catfish was, was from not too smart stock. Uh, he was from not so smart stock because his, his father moved to Plymouth to start a sawmill because he didn't think that George Easton, with whom he was working, was ever going to make it. Uh, and I heard that from Jim Catfish. When, when, when the federal authorities came to close the Climate Bank in 1933, Catfish was also a member of the board, so he sent his, his, uh, his workers from the sawmill down to meet the revenue who were coming to take, take over the bank. This is a story I heard just last summer. I don't have any confirmation of it. There was no confrontation. But it was that level of intensity and that level, level of concern and that level of animated disgust that was existed here. 